أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنته الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هذان خصمان اختصموا في ربهم فالذين كفروا قطعت لهم ثياب من نار يصب من فوق رؤوسهم الحميم صدق الله العلي العظيم and there are two parties who argued amongst one another about Allah سبحانه وتعالى as for the ones who disbelieve i.e. cover up the truth then there has been tailored for them clothing from the fire of hell and upon them will be poured the boiling waters of hell. This verse in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically speaks about two parties. He says, خَصْمَان اختصموا That there's specifically two parties. He doesn't use the plural to say that it is many parties. Or there's many people that argue and talk in this way. He says there is two parties, only two. One is the party of truth. The other is the party of kufr. And as we know, kufr means to cover up the truth. He says, as for the one who covers up the truth, then their wrath is the fire of hell. This is a precedent. This is a principle. This is a core axis that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares and establishes throughout the Holy Quran. That it's always about two parties. One has the haqq and the truth and the right and the other covers up the haqq. Simple as that. When they ask the Imam for the tafsir of this verse, he says this verse is regarding the battle of Badr. And in the battle of Badr, the two parties were the party of Imam Ali and the children of Abu Sufyan. In another tradition, when they ask the Imam, he says, Verily, نحن وبنو أمية اختصمنا في الله عز وجل قلنا صدق الله وقالوا كذبا كذب الله that we said that Allah says the truth and they say he does not say the truth. These two parties are a precedent. That's all they are. When we look at Banu Hashim and Banu Umayyah, they are a precedent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set from history for today and into the future. The saga of Karbala, the saga that happened to Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi on the day of Ashura and in this holy month, tomorrow or the day after is simply a precedent that represents the past, the present and the future. It is something that has been decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from long ago. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mankind with the reason with the reason to see who is the best of doers. He had a plan from the beginning when the angels said to him that why would you create this? Will you create what will cause mischief and bloodshed? Whereas we sit here and we praise you. We do tasbih the whole time. We worship and obey. Why would you create a mischief monger and when he, when he goes to create the human being and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, I know what you know not. I know what ye know not. That from the beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what will be of the future. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that there's something that's coming in fact in the traditions. It is said that the land of Karbala was selected before the creation. And once it was created that area was there. Not only that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had actually made a grave for Imam al-Husayn there. That in this land this will happen. So many a time this is what faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all about. The best thing that we can have is Al-Imanu Billah. Faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest thing in our religion. This Iman and this faith is about knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned for the future. Believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the solution for the future. Yet we can't see it before our eyes. So the angels, they turn back. Away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that what is this that you're creating? You see, 
the two parties. When Iblis refuses to prostrate to Adam, you see the two parties. Iblis and the angels. The angels accept, they prostrate. Uh, Iblis refuses. He says, oh Allah, whatever you want, but I won't prostrate to Adam. In the same way, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this religion of truth, this religion of truth, this Islam, the Islam of Musa, the Islam of Isa, the Islam of Muhammad. Wow. Muhammad, wa Ali Muhammad. It's the same Islam of Hussein and the same Islam of the Mahdi, insha'Allah. That this faith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down through all of the prophets, that if two people argue about God and about truth, they will come to this conclusion. Ultimately, you will arrive and end up at this conclusion. The conclusion of the faith of truth. Not Christianity, not Judaism, not Buddhism, not Buddhism, Afwan, not any of these new age religions. Nothing will stand out as a point of truth. And in fact, when Imam Ali السلام, advises Kumail ibn Ziyad, what does he say to him? He says, Ya Kumail, in jadalta fillah, Azza wa Jal, فَلَا تُجَادِلْ إِلَّا مَنْ يَشْبَهُ الْعُقَلَاءُ وَهَذِهِ ضَرُورًا That do not debate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except with one who looks like a sane person or an intellectual person. This is of utmost importance. Because ultimately it breaks down to two parties. It's two parties. The party of truth and the other party. Simple as that. The party that has the haq and the other party. Two parties. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically says this in the Holy Quran. And so we see this same precedent that is held out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala selects this pure land of Karbala and he selects Imam al-Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa to be martyred to be able to set a precedent of protection against tyranny forever. That Imam al-Hussein and the actions of Imam al-Hussein are a protection for this forever. People argue about what the point of us gathering today to commemorate Ashura, to commemorate the martyrdom of this holy Imam. They ask that why do we all gather together and come when it is something in the past, when it's something that happened, something that's gone. They look at the past as something that we just erase. If we erase our past, how will we learn for our future? How will we understand for our future? And past and present is a pretext or a pretense that we seem to comprehend. Whereas in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the past and the present and, and, and the future are the same thing. They don't change anything with his knowledge or his ability or his power. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala initially set this precedent that involved the martyrdom of Abu Abdullah for our protection. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through his holy prophet, he commanded the people... He said to them, Arta'u fi riyadh al jannah He says that graze or walk amongst the lands of paradise. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, where are these lands of paradise? He says to them that the riyadh al jannah are majalis ahl al dhikr. That the gatherings that remember the remembrance of Allah. The ga gatherings where you get together and you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember the signs of Allah. You remember the people of Allah. These are what these gatherings are about. That we come here although we sit together in this gathering. In a building we are actually sitting in paradise yet we perceive it not. We don't see it. But on the day of judgment you will see that you were actually sitting in paradise for this period of time. And you will think to yourself when I left, why did I leave when I had this much longer to remain within paradise? During the uh, problems that are ha happening overseas at the moment in Iraq, one of the ulama in Iraq was visited by a journalist. And the journalist came up to him and he said that I am seeing what is happening. That these people, these people who are the same as the people who killed Imam al Hussein, they have the same mentality, the same thought, the same logic. This is the same process that they have. In fact, there is a tradition where Hind, the mother of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, she has a dream. And in her dream, she calls Aisha and she says, I oh know, fantastic narration. She calls Aisha and she says to her, go and ask your husband, the Holy Prophet, what my dream means. 
So she says, what was your dream? She says that I saw the sun. And then from within me, a moon came out. From that moon that came out from within me, a black star came out of that moon. And from the sun, a bright star came out. Then this black star swallowed the light star, the bright, bright star. It swallowed the bright star. And then the sun was extinguished. The sky went black. And there were some bright stars in the sky. But I looked below to the world, to the earth. And within the, our world, it was full of black stars. So the Prophet begins to cry. And so Aisha says, why do you cry? He says, you have brought such bad memories upon you. So the, the Prophet knows about what's going to happen. She says, what does it mean? He says that it means that from the bright sun, meaning Rasulullah is going to come a beautiful bright star, which is Imam al-Husayn. And from the moon that comes from you, a black star, which is the son of Muawiyah. The moon is Muawiyah, the son of Muawiyah being Yazid. is going to come out and he will kill my son. So the Imam, Rasulullah begins to cry. And then he says, when she looks down to the earth and sees it is full of black stars, he says that the Banu Umayyah will take control of this Ummah. That they will have all the power in this Ummah. This is what the meaning of her dream was. We see today that this same thing is happening. So these people that have no logic or no thought towards Islam and they begin to kill people, they begin to burn houses, they begin to capture women as slaves and sell them, they begin to cut people's heads off, they crucify people. The ancient torture method of crucifixion that we thought was long gone and something that's only remembered on the necklace of a Christian. And we see it, that it is occurring again. Placing the, 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 the heads on lampposts, etc., etc. These people and their, their vicious and their wild actions. And so this journalist comes up to the alim and he says, I am surprised. And the alim says, why are you surprised? He says, I am surprised that these people are doing this much to the Shia. And the Shia are so patient and forbearant. Why are they so patient? That specifically in Iraq, 60 to 65 percent, the larger portion, is Shia. That you have the ability to obliterate these people. So the alim said to her, how long have you been in Iraq? She said to him, or the journalist, sorry, said to him, that I have been in Iraq for over a year. He says, so you have witnessed Ashura? She says, yes, I have witnessed Ashura. He says, do you know what this is about? She says, what is it about? He says, 1400 years ago, one man was oppressed. And we haven't shut up about it. Do you think we're going to take up arms and oppress another person? Our religion is against oppression. To them, this is how they understand it. They don't know who al Hussein ibn Ali is. To them, it's one man that was oppressed. And this is what we do to this day. Throughout all over the world, we get together and we commemorate. And we remember. And we reaffirm our bay'ah, our allegiance to the Imam, and our allegiance to stand up for what is right, and our allegiance to stand against tyranny. For verily, this is the purpose of our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا الْسَمَاءُ وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَعِبِينَ That we didn't create the heavens and the earth as a thing of play. Is that all it is? We're here for a, for a short time. Or well, we're here, sorry, for a fun time, not a, not a long time. We're here for a short time that have as much fun as you want. There's not enough time on this earth, so why waste your time on belief? Then what is your purpose? So many people try and find purpose in all sorts of things. In the most wrong things. They go into a hobby, for example. What is it that concerns us on a day-to-day -day ba basis? If, is this the purpose of our lives? Whatever we're concerned by. Who won the football? Is this a concern of our life? That this year the green team wins it, next year blue team will win it, the year after yellow team will But we take it in this country as an identity. What team do you go for? First question, you have to tell me what team you go for. Because they take it as an identity and as a purpose. Is this your purpose in life? The super rich, they become so rich that they don't even know what to do with their lives anymore. They say, I'm so rich, I don't know what to do, I think I'm going to open a farm. I'm so rich, I don't know what to do, I think I'm just going to go sled down a mountain. I'm so rich, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to travel to every city I wanted to travel to. Is this a purpose? Once they've completed this, and then what? And then what? Or our purpose? Whatever we collect or whatever we do as our pastimes, or whatever we do to just pass time, is this the purpose? The value of a human being is his purpose in life. The famous saying that says, if you have nothing to die for, then your life is not worth living. This is the truth. You have nothing to die for.
then your life is not worth living. Imam al Hussein taught us that if you're going to die for something, die for something worthwhile. Imam al Hussein taught us that in this world, it is not worth living purposeless. Because eventually you were going to meet your Creator. And what will you say at this time? That I was just here and I didn't know what to do, so I just did whatever came naturally. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala set an agenda. The second thing Imam al Hussein, or the most important thing, sorry, that Imam al Hussein came for. People write all sorts of theories of why the Imam revolted. Most clearly, the Imam's revolution, and it was a revolution, was all about obeying the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the command of the Holy Prophet. Simple as that. When he says in his statement, إِنِّي مَا خَرَجْتُ أَشَرًا وَلَا بَطَرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا وَلَا ظَالِمًا إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ فِي أُمَّتِي, في أمتي جَدِّي That I have come لِطَلَبِ الْإِصْلَاحِ That I did not come out, not as an oppressor, not as a vain person, not as someone that is an ingrate. I haven't come to command power over you people. I have come out for a message of reform, revolution. That did you forget the, the core message? When my grandfather came and taught you about the religion, did you forget about this? That you have swayed so far and gone so far away from the faith that it needs a revolution. There is time for a revolution. The time is ripe for a revolution. This is all that it's about. Over these ten nights, we need to learn and understand where does this revolution begin? And it begins within our hearts. It begins within ourselves. And then this revolution takes over society. This revolution of the right and the correct path. That yes, we are living and we're doing what we do, but is it, we're doing what we do, but is it correct? And this is why the Imam sallallahu alayhi he went out and he revolted. He refused. The core thing was they wanted his allegiance. If we commit, compare this to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, after he had the treaty with Imam al-Hasan, they made a treaty. And the treaty of the Imam was that once Muawiyah dies, the Imam al-Hasan becomes the Khalif. And if Imam al-Hasan dies before, then Imam al-Hussein takes the position. So Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, he goes out in the day, not during the dhuhr. On a Friday, during the day, they say it was probably morning or early morning, and he calls for Salat al Jumu'ah. And he prays with them. This is what sort of a person he is. doesn't care about religion. He prays with them Salat al Jumu'ah at some time in the day before the dhuhr. But he doesn't care. He'll pray it on any day, and then he says to them, that I did not fight you to pray, nor did I fight you so you can fast, nor did I fight you so you can be righteous, because you already do all of these things. I fight you so I can be a commander over you. So you must obey me. And this treaty with Imam al Hassan is beneath my feet. He throws it on the floor and he steps on it. That these words that I signed to it are nothing. What is the value of this person that cares not about prayer or fasting? What is the value of this person if he cares not? about the treaties that he makes. His word has no value. What value does he have? His word has no value. Imam Sadiq tells you when you look for friends and companions, do not look for the one who prays the most and fasts the most. Look for the one who keeps his word, who stands by his word, who is a real man, and stands by his word. The Imam al Hussein alayhi salam refused to plead allegiance to Yazid ibn Ma'al. He says, the likes of me, la yubaya mithla. The likes of me would not plead allegiance to the likes of him. He is Sharab al-Khamr. He is a person who is a drunkard. He is a person who kills the respected personalities. And from this one word, his refusal, they wanted to push it. And the further they pushed it, did they forget who they were speaking to? Did they forget who they were speaking to? We sometimes depict our holy personalities in the wrong way. You know when we speak about... <coughs> Inshallah, we'll talk about the personality of Imam al-Hussein tomorrow or the day after. When we speak about, when you see the Christians speak about Jesus Christ, they show images of Jesus with blonde hair and white skin, chilling with a few lambs and some children sitting next to him in a, in a green field. Is this who Jesus Christ actually was? Or did Jesus enter the temple when the Jews were trading and dealing in the temple and he flipped their tables? 
He flipped their tables and when they didn't listen, he turned them into pigs and monkeys and cast them into the sea, off the cliff. This is in the Bible. This is also in our hadith. But this is who Jesus is when we talk about Imam al Hussein. Yes, Imam al Hussein was all of these things. He was good. He was the springtime of the orphans, the family of the orphans. He was all of this. He was somebody who had a great status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he was also the son of Abi, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He was also a warrior. And if you want to go this way, this is my soft and smooth side. You want to take the other way, if, war, if it's war that you want and battle than you want, then it's war and battle that you'll get. This is the truth of Imam al-Hussain. And this is what happened. And we'll see. In some of the traditions, a man by the name of Rayyan ibn al-Shabib. Ibn al-Shabib or ibn Shabib went to Imam al radha and he says, I spoke to Imam al And this is a long narration. We won't have time to, to speak about the whole narration. However, inshallah, we'll speak about it tomorrow night because it's a brilliant narration. In fact, it is one of the, the, the best sourced narrations. Uh, and I have sourced it personally from the book Nafas al-Mahmoom by Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi is someone who is known as Muhaddith al-Qummi because he is a muhaqqiq, that he doesn't use a tradition unless he's certain that it is solid, that it is well established, that it has this solid backing of narration. And he says, Ibn Shabib walks up to Imam al radha he says, and I sit with Imam al radha and Imam al radha says to him, and it's the first day of Muharram, he says to him, O oh, son of Shabib, are you fasting? This is the first day of Muharram. And the son of Shabib says, no, I'm not fasting. He says to him, that did you not know that on this day, the first day of Muharram, this is the day, inshallah it will be tomorrow or the day after, we're unsure because of the moon sighting. But either way, tomorrow or the day after, try and fast, it's something that's very mustahab on the first day of Muharram. He says, do you not know that on the first day of Muharram, Nabi Zakaria fasted? And anyone that fasts on the first day of Muharram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill whatever he asks. He says, Nabi Zakaria fasted and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to give him this son, Yahya, that he saw that Sayyidah Maryam had a child without having a husband, a child without a father, he says, then surely even me in my old age can have. And so he says to him, on this day he fasted and he asked Allah, Rabbi habli min ladunka dhurriyatan tayyiba, innaka samia dua fastajab Allah lah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua and he says, anna Allah yubashiruka bi Yahya. So he says, whoever fasts on this day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept his fast, will accept his dua on the first of Muharram. He says to him, O son of Shabib, do you know that this month of Muharram is a month that has hurma, sanctity, the concept of hurma. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sanctifies certain places, he sanctifies, sanctifies certain lands, certain times of day with his authority, certain structures with his authority. That they are sanctified, like this day, Friday. Friday is a sanctified day. You do a good deed, you get double the reward. You do a bad deed, you get double the punishment. Any of the sanctified days, even in Shah Ramadan, the sanctified personalities. For example, in the days of Hajj, when you are in the state of Ihram, when you are near the Kaaba, when you are in any of these places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sanctified it. And this sanctity means that if you do good, it's augmented. And if you do bad, it is also augmented. It's much worse than doing bad on a normal day. Because these are sacred times. He says that, did you know that Muharram is a sacred month, so sacred, that even in the days of Jahiliyyah, the month was sanctified, that in the days of Jahiliyyah they wouldn't fight in this month. They wouldn't kill each other, they wouldn't hurt because this was a sanctified month. He says, however, on this month, this Ummah, the Ummah of Rasulullah, the people who claim to be the Ummah of Rasulullah didn't adhere to the sanctity of this month. He says, لَقَدْ قَتَلُوا فِي هَذَا الشَّهْرِ ذُرِّيَّةَ وَسَبُوا نِسَاءَهُ That in this month, they killed his offspring. In this month, they took his women folk and children prisoner. In this month, they stole his wealth. This is a sanctified month of Allah that even the people of Jahiliyyah sanctified it. They desecrated this hurma. O oh, son of Shabib, if you are going to cry about something in Kuntabakian, he says, فَأَبْكِي لِلْحُسَيْنِ بْنَ عَلِيِّ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبِ 
That if you are going to cry about something, cry about the desecration of the sanctity of this Imam. We're out of time. But inshallah this tradition is longer and I would like to really speak longer about this tradition because it speaks about the importance of crying for Imam al Hussein. It speaks about the importance of this month and the importance of our holy Imam Abu Abdullah Hussein sallallahu wa sallamahu alayhi. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bi fanaik. Alaykum minni salamu allahi abdan ma baqeet wa baqiya al-layl wa al-nahar wa la ja'aluhu allahu akhir al-ahdi minni li ziyaratikum. السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين رحم الله من كرأ سورة المباركة الفاتحة وآذى توابها إلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات تسبق الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد الله أكبر الله